the product is fashionable yet sensible and versatile. You know, these are products that women can wear year after year after year, yet somehow they feel at the forefront of, you know, the trend without being trendy, if you know what I mean. So I think it's a, definitely a brand that has proven itself over a very, very, very long period of time and keeps coming back year after year, collection after collection with wonderful staples that really last for so many years. This is the Safari. The Safari is a tour around the consumer, brand, and retailing industry. And we have the great privilege here at my company, Traub, to really be exposed to many of the great minds of the industry who are forming and shaping the future of many different parts of the consumer, brand, and retail world. And I felt it was quite interesting for us to be able to not only learn from all of those people as we do every day, but uh, memorialize it into a podcast, which could then be shared with many of our friends and clients and, and you, obviously, the listener. Today, I am joined by Sarah Blank, one of the two of the dynamic duo of Sarah Blank and Melinda Robertson, who are uh, the co-founders of um, Scal and Theodore, particularly uh, their international business, which we'll get into a little bit later on. And what's amazing about these two women is that, in fact, originally they were financiers you know, in the finance world. And after so many people complimenting them on what they wore, they decided to seek out uh, their favorite brand, which is what they wore all the time. It was an Australian uh, brand that they grew up wearing and still wore in America and beyond and decided to enter into a partnership uh, with that brand, which is Scanlon Theodore. And the, really, the rest is history. And what I'm here to talk to Sarah about is you know, that journey of transitioning from one industry to another, um, the, the journey of obviously building a fashion business in the United States and, and outside of Australia. And then maybe we'll talk a little bit about sort of what she's seeing in the consumer mindset and through the lens of her business, given that at this recording, we are still in confinement uh, from COVID-19. She's in Florida. I'm in uh, Massachusetts. And so here we go. Uh, thank you, Sarah, so much for joining me. On Good morning, Safari. Maudie. Thank you so much for having me. How how is everything down there? Are you keeping keeping uh, sane with your three children running around while being asked to do podcasts? <laughs> I am. Uh, I'm hanging on by a thread. I, 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 uh, it's been a challenge for everybody, but um, no, we feel very fortunate to be in Florida. You know, I think um, I was saying to you earlier, I had come down here in March to open our store at Bal Harbor shops. And, um, and then everything sort of closed all of a sudden mid March and we never got to open that store. Um, and we stayed down here, um, you know, and hopefully we'll be opening in the next few weeks, uh, probably a couple of weeks before New York opens up again. But, um, that's sort of why I'm here and we're lucky to be here. Great weather. Blue opening skies. Up. I, I love talking about opening up. That's just a wonderful <laughs> term, right? You know, who, who knew we'd be sort of so excited about such an expression? Exactly. <laughs> so, so you are um, a dynamic duo. Talk a little bit about Melinda, your friendship, your alliance, and how you stumbled across uh, deciding, you know what, we're going to go and become entrepreneurs. So Sure. So uh, Melinda, who goes by Min, Min and I have known each other for many, many years, probably since we were about 10 years old. We grew up together in Melbourne, Australia, and um, we've been friends for a very long time. We have had similar career paths in that we've both worked overseas for many years. You know, we left Australia and um, I worked in a number of places. She worked in a number of places and we've both um, spent a long time in professional services, particularly in um, finance. Melinda was working at Goldman Sachs. I was working at PIMCO in New York and uh, we we were shopping in Australia, our favourite brand, um, you know, that, that we sort of grew up with in Australia and, um, you know, loved and, you know, continue to love. And we were uh, bringing, bringing those clothes back to um, 
back to New York and getting dressed and going to work, we were just getting so much wonderful feedback on the product that we thought, um, you know, there's an opportunity here. Very good. And, uh, and ultimately <laughs> you then had to go and, and seek out your now partner uh, and uh, form an alliance, correct? Yeah, we did. We thought, look, there's a, there's a real opportunity to dress the professional woman in New York and potentially in the United States. There's this wonderful product that has done well over three decades in Australia. You know, it's, it's made from European fabrics and, and these are Australian designs. It's something that's, that's getting great feedback, you know, that we were hearing anecdotally great feedback on. And, um, you know, we sort of thought, look, let's, let's go down to Australia and see if there's an opportunity to grow this brand internationally. We think there might be something here. So one of the things I love about, you know, the conversations I've had on the safari over the last months is this notion of left and right brain, cross-functional expertise, um, and people coming at things from different vantage points. So you obviously came into, let's call it the fashion industry, uh, as um, business people, as uh, numbers people, finance people. You obviously don't have to create anything because your wonderful partners back home are the designers though i'm sure we'll talk about how much feedback you actually give them about your market and whether you do exclusives for for your markets outside of australia um but tell tell me what it was like arriving squarely basically into the fashion industry on day one um with zero experience and what were the instances where that was a challenge and where do you think maybe looking back it was probably an asset Oh goodness. It's always a challenge. It's always a challenge. I mean, we, we, sometimes we laugh that we, um, left our sort of stable, um, you know, well-paying jobs in finance where we felt comfortable and where we felt like we could, um, you know, perform. And we went into the world of fashion, not knowing anything about fashion and, and the world of retail, right. During what is essentially a retail apocalypse. So we've gone from this, this very challenging retail environment into this sort of pandemic. And I think it's, it's always challenging, but I think coming at it, we, we didn't really think about it so much as fashion or retail. We just thought about it as there is this fantastic product that we are both obsessed with that many, many women who have grown up in Australia have, have grown up and loved. And there's an opportunity for us to sell that product. I think both of us are very good at sales. Um, we're resourceful. Um, you know, that when you talk about sort of functional, capabilities. Um, you know, we certainly understand how to run a company from a financial perspective. You know, we've been focused on, on sort of very cautious, careful growth and profitability since day one. So I think that is something that has been very helpful to bring to the table. We're not fashion people, but we don't need to be fashion people. Um, we're not the creators and we don't need to be the creators. And, and that um, bringing a fresh mindset um, to to this business and bringing more business acumen to the business, I think has probably uh, really, really helped us. Mm -hmm. And talk to me a little bit about, you know, <laughs> Aussie, Aussie brand, you know, uh, we talk a lot about uh, at Traub, this notion of the, the new ilk of, um, of, of brands emerging around the world that are more chill, uh, have a different sensibility to them. Um, and I'm not sure that's necessarily what you're striving for at Scanlon Theodore, but I think the Australian brand vibe has its own thing going. We, we often use the, the moniker, you know, less Paris, New York and Milan and more Montreal, LA and Sydney, um, you know, as a notion of this transitional mindset. Now, maybe it means more than it, it's, it's more that more the case than ever before, uh, given what's going on in the world, people really sort of coming back to basics, maybe, um, tell us about the brand DNA. What, what is the brand? Who is the brand Scanlon Theodore? You know, I think, um, you know, to your point on Australia, I think Australian design has in recent years, you know, quite recent years, I would say the last, you know, three to five years, um, really been more broadly recognized, um, whether it be, you know, design with respect to architecture or, uh, with respect to different, you know, fashion brands, um, also just in terms of high quality products, whether it be in food and beverage, um, the wine industry, you know, Australia produces really great quality products across so many different industries. And I think 
Australia as part of, uh, you know, part of the brand DNA f- across many industries is, is quite helpful right now with that global recognition that, um, you know, our country produces top quality, top notch products. Um, so I think the Australian design is definitely a part of a large part of the brand um, DNA. You know, I think also the brand DNA really is centered in, you know, I would say timeless, stylish, high quality products, you know, great polish, great fits, yeah. very flattering, elegant, chic um, clothing, you know, simple, clean lines, modern um, modern lines, very sophisticated and very feminine. I think, you know, our clients tell us that the product is fashionable yet sensible and versatile. You know, these are products that women can wear year after year after year, yet somehow they feel at the forefront of, um, you know, the trend without being trendy, if you know what I mean. So I think it's definitely a brand that, um, has proven itself over a very, very, very long period of time and keeps coming back year after year, collection after collection with wonderful um, staples that that really last um, for so many years um, and a lifetime for some people. So that's great. Yeah, that would be sort of the DNA, I think. And so you guys, uh, I think pretty early on, maybe immediately uh, opened a store. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, is that isn't that right? You kind of went straight in with we're opening your own retail, correct? We yeah, we sort of went straight into opening direct to consumer retail um, stores. You know, we yeah. our first store was in Soho. So my 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 question therefore is, you know, maybe one decision you made that um, maybe was obvious to you, um, and maybe you were th- analyzing the trends and because of your analytical backgrounds, who knows, but you've kind of opened a business, um, uh, doing all the things that, um, many companies wish they had the ability to do, which is to touch the consumer directly, both with their own stores, as well as, um, as well as their e-commerce sites, not to say that you shouldn't be doing, uh, wholesaling, which I'm sure you are and many, Others do as well, but it's about having that balance and being able to touch the consumer. Obviously, your stores, as we stand today, are soon to be reopened. Let's, let's say that versus <laughs> let's the, hope, uh, let's hope. <laughs> versus the reverse. Um, but um, talk about you know how, how important has it been to you to touch the consumer to have your own e-commerce site? Maybe if you can share any any um, quarantine musings that you've seen about how the consumers behaved online, um, etc. Yeah, this is a really interesting question and it's really difficult to, you know, there are so many facets to it and it's really difficult to answer. I, I would start by saying we opened retail stores because we spent some time at the beginning in the very early days, you know, running around the city with bags full of clothes and hosting people in our apartments and, you know, really working at, um, you know, conferences and events and, and selling in person um, in a very sort of grassroots way. And it really worked, you know, connecting with a woman um, in person one-on-one and offering styling advice we found really worked. And so we knew we had to um, meet our client in person, share with her um, our knowledge and passion for the product and explain, uh, you know, the fabrics and the styles and and the designs in person and and dress her and make her feel great. So that, that actually is a really important part of the brand. I think we're very well known for in-person styling and we do a great job of that. It's, it's really part of the DNA of the brand. So we knew it was important to get in front of the client directly. Um, and, and so it felt natural for us to move into a first physical store. Uh, now that's not to say that, you know, online and e-commerce isn't very, very important and perhaps increasingly important um, especially given sort of what we're going through at the moment. But it's interesting, you know, during this crisis, we actually did a little survey um, of our clients and 80% of them told us that they prefer to shop in store, um, which was really interesting uh, to us, you know, and maybe it has to do with our product, you know, we're a higher price point, more luxury uh, product that people want to feel and touch and, you know, they want to feel confident about the fabrics and the sizing and, um, you know, the amount probably that they're spending. Um, So that probably helps drive them to store. And then another area where we received a lot of great feedback was on, was on the styling. You know, a lot of our clients want that personal touch. They want the advice 
um, that we give them. They want us to be their personal shopper. And so they're looking to, um, to come to us in person. So it did feel like a natural step to move into a physical brick and mortar environment. Um, and it felt like a natural step for us to be um, communicating on the brand rather than outsourcing that to somebody else via some kind of a wholesale model. It just didn't feel right. And I don't think we would have been as successful if we had have gone down that path. No question. So as you think about um, the, your wonderful new store in, in Bell Harbor, uh, your stores uh, in New York, uh, Hudson Yards specifically, which has been doing incredibly well, I know. Mm-hmm. How do you think about, and, and you may not have a clear answer on this, but I think it's it's fun and, or interesting to muse about it uh, together, about this notion of what it means to try on clothes, to send clothes to people, um, by, uh, you know, in this, in this post COVID world. And in fact, it's not really a post COVID world for the foreseeable future. I think it's going to be a COVID world. Um, mm-hmm. have you, have you started putting ideas to paper about how you might reopen and some of the practices you might implement around, um, you know, how, how to wear garments, how to try garments, et cetera? Yeah, no, this is this is imperative. We've spent a lot of time thinking about this and putting a plan of action together um, to be able to sort of communicate to our clients and then provide an environment where they feel safe, where they feel they can come in, where they feel things are clean um, and where we can provide that service, um, you know, in a safe environment for our customers as well as for our employees. So some of the things that, you know, we're thinking about doing and and this will be... A learning experience I think for everybody so this will probably adapt over time as we slowly open and we learn um, about what this world looks like as we come out of this um, but some of the things we're looking at doing are limiting the number of people in store at any given time to allow for social distancing uh, we want to make sure that we're offering masks you know one of the key ways to avoid transmission going forward is going to be the use of masks Um, and so if you have two people in an environment with with the doors wide open you're facilitating natural airflow and those people are wearing masks it's very very difficult for one person to infect another person so masks are going to be important Um, you know hand sanitizer uh, is going to be important so all those sort of things that you think about um, will be important and we need to make sure that we're offering those up and then providing uh, an, an environment where we can separate clients. Uh, so we've set up the store in a way where we can separate clients and we can be serving um, a couple of clients at a time in very designated different areas. Um, you know, and then some of the trickier things will be, um, you know, clothing and hangers and what people touch. We need to make sure that we're cleaning surfaces, that we're cleaning hangers, um, that we have a disinfectant protocol in place. We need to make sure that after clothes are tried on, uh, we dry clean them, uh, we steam them at high temperatures. You know, we make sure that we're giving uh, clients scarves to protect um, from touching the clothes too much. So, you know, it's it's going to be tricky and it's going to be a bit of a work in progress and it's going to be labour intensive, um, but we have to make sure that that we're providing that environment, um, you know, otherwise our clients won't trust us and they, they won't come in because I think people will still be afraid to get sick until we've really eradicated this disease. Yeah, I think it's interesting. The other thing that people are thinking about is segmenting their demographics of their customers into, as, you, as you've seen in the grocery stores, they are making or asking or, or trying to open early and late for older uh, generations. I think in your case, you maybe not, you maybe don't have that many in that demographic, but I'm sure you do because, um, you know, it's a it's a psychographic now they you know today not not necessarily demographic so there are many women of 60 70 years old who feel and look you know 20 years younger um and therefore they are able to uh, but they're able to shop with you but may not feel comfortable being there with many different people um and the question is given their demographic would they be able to come at different times of the day um because potentially they're not necessarily working anymore, they're retired or semi-retired to have them come in, you know, around um, the afternoon versus in the evening, which might be better and more convenient for uh, a younger woman who needs to get in there before going home or whatever it may be. Uh, it's a really interesting sort of juggling your your clients, right, um, and, and their time. How do you feel about, how do you feel about, you know, the categories of goods? So, um, 
I think what's wonderful about your brand and your product is that, as you said earlier on, um, the cost per wear perception is wonderful with you guys, right? Unlike fashion, uh, right. really fashion in the true sense of the word, which is almost disposable in the sense it might be expensive, but it goes out of fashion very quickly. Um, yours are timeless pieces, which can be worn over and over again. How do you think about where people are going to spend their money going forward and how that fits into your business plan and how you might need to amend or adapt or add certain categories to 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 work with um, the new realities that we face? You know, I think I don't I don't have an answer to that. I don't know what people are going to spend their money on coming out of this. I, I can guess, I can speculate, and my feeling, my sense, my anecdotal kind of response to that is that I think people um, have felt like they've been locked up for a long time and they want to get out, they want to, you know, w- women who like to dress up want to put on a glittery top and a pair of high heels and go out to dinner on a Saturday night. I think, um, you know, we are tired of wearing active wear and jeans all day at home. You know, there's an element of, um, you know, I think there's... Whiplash. Some, yeah, whiplash, revenge, then whatever you want to call it. But I think there's an element of I want to go out, get dressed up and live again. And so my sense is that there will be some kind of reward spending. You know, I want to go out and go shopping. I want to reward myself because this has been a really difficult two months. Um, you know, I, I didn't get my you know, European, summer European trip this year. And so I'm going to go shopping instead, or I think that there will be an element of that. Um, and, you know, personally, I, I love to dress up and I'm looking forward to going out and dressing up again. Um, so I think to your question, you know, what do we offer? My sense on this is that it's, you can't be all things to all people at all times. And so throughout this, we haven't really tried to be the stay at home brand because that's not what we're about. We are a brand that women love to wear outside of the house. You know, we do amazing suits that look fabulous at conferences and in boardrooms and at meetings. And, you know, our woman is busy and she travels and, you know, she's on the go and that's, that's the kind of woman that we're dressing. And so I think, you know, we, we will be there for her when, when she feels she's ready to go out and get dressed up again. And she wants to, and she feels safe and, you know, we'll be there for her. Um, I don't think we're, we're going to become the athleisure brand, um, or, or the loungewear brand, um, of choice because it's just not what we do. Um, and it would be disingenuous if we tried to sort of morph into those categories and offer something that's just not, not us, I think to our clients. I think you're so right. I, 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 I worry for actually those companies that decided to pivot completely now into other areas that they're not familiar with. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly to speak about whiplash, people don't want to touch their, their yoga pants ever again because of this, me- <laughs> the memory of this time, right? It's probably, you know, pro- people will probably end up doing yoga in, in Scanlon Theodore suits, you know, just to say, <laughs> I ne- never want to touch one of those things again. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, no, I, I think it, it's, it's, it'll be interesting. There's going to be obviously two camps, those people who, who will say, look, I'm, I gotta, I gotta live my life and I'm going to live it to the, to the hilt now, actually. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then the others who will by definition be the opposite and be more fearful and more conservative and more reserved and take time to, to leave. And the question, which neither you nor I nor anyone else has the answer to is, what percentage will be in what camp i think um which is exactly. uh, which is which is difficult so um all things being equal let's let's pretend none of this um happened which would be lovely wouldn't it lovely um, race. <laughs> to talk talk about the plans that you had for the business which i'm sure in some measure will remain the same um and you know, what are your hopes for the business and the brand and where are you going with this company? And because it's really a remarkable business and, and you guys have done such a great job at taking it out of its, of its mother country, creating this partnership. I mean, the, the prospects for what you just described 
um, I think are immense for uh, for consumers all over the world, let alone the United States. So, what were your plans? So let's 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 talk about the, the fun stuff that should have been, and I believe will be, uh, for Scanlon Theodore. Well, you know, coming into this, we, we'd come off a couple of years of building the foundation of the business um, in the US and, and building a strong client base and, and building some brand recognition over here. Um, and we were looking at opening more stores. And so we were looking at a number of different regions across the country um, that we feel particularly passionate about and where we think we uh, could be successful. We we're looking at those regions and we um, had a list of sort of target areas and we still have a list of target areas to, um, you know, to increase our network of brick and mortar stores. In addition to that, um, we were and continue to explore many different ideas on how to improve and expand our e-commerce business um, and then we'd also, you know, had a, a couple of conversations around wholesale, um, but they, I would say they sort of had not uh, taken off um, in any meaningful way um, at this point in time. So we were sort of more focused on the DT, DTC side of the business, um, both from sort of a brick and mortar and, and e-com perspective. Yeah, I, I think... Um... I think that, that that day shall come again. And I, I believe that, as I've said now two or three times in this podcast, brands like yours that have the foundation of let's build an optimized business for profit and not just for growth will will be the ones that will be here five to 10 years from now. Um, so you know, I like to try and um, end these discussions with sort of you, you having the last word, as it were. Um, so, so what are the things that you'd like to communicate? And they can be anything. It doesn't have to be necessarily about the business, but um, a message uh, about, about you, something personal, uh, something about the world we're living in, um, uh, even a book you've been reading. Um, your, yours is the last word. Oh, thanks, buddy. You know, I think... Um... At the moment, we're in survival mode. We're trying to survive. You know, we're trying to get through this. It's a really difficult time for everybody. Um, it's a difficult time for the business from a balance sheet perspective. So there's a real financial concern there and we're, we're doing the best we can and we hope that we, that we make it through. And then I think personally, you know, I think a lot about my kids. You know, I have three kids at home and I think that they will remember coronavirus 2020 they will you know I have a seven-year-old I have a four-year-old so those those two in particular will remember this time and they will they don't know it now but they will look back and they will say you know that was a really tough time for mom and dad and they were both trying to save their businesses and you know homeschool us and you know provide a, a stable happy environment at the same time and so you know, I, I spend a lot of my day um, trying to be a good mum to them because I want them to look back and say, despite everything that was going on and how difficult that was for them and for, you know, everybody at the time, you know, I think mum and dad did a good job of not really letting on or protecting us from the reality of what was happening and we were happy and we we had more time with them and we did great things and we had adventures and you know, it was a happy time. So I think um, despite all of the stress and the anxiety and the concern for the, f for the future of our businesses, for the future of our family, um, you know, and, and I don't do a good job, job of this every day. Some days are better than others, but I, I am trying to, um, to give them the best possible experience I can because I, I do want them to look back on this with, with a positive view and with positive memories. I'm sure to many parents listening to you out there, um, you're quite a wonderful role model. So, you know, Sarah Blank, you've got a lot of things going on behind you with three kids over there and a business to, to run. So thanks for spending time with me on the safari and um, hopefully we'll see each other in person one day. Thanks so much for having me, Marty. All right. Thanks so much. Bye, Sarah. Bye. If you want to learn a little bit more about Traub, you can go to traub.io where you'll learn a lot about everything that we do. 
If you're enjoying the safari, please do share it with your friends and colleagues within the industry. And please also don't forget to subscribe and like it. Until next time.